We're glad that you're here. We're in the middle of Romans 8. It is perhaps the most, if not the most, one of the most encouraging chapters in all of the Bible. And uh, we'll get into that here in just a few moments. But we're glad that you got safely here and we'll get into our study after a word of prayer. If you will bow with me, please. Our awesome Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your high and holy name. We are in awe of your creative power. We are in awe of your omnipotence and your omniscience and your omnipresence. There is nowhere that we can go that you are not. There is nothing that you do not know. There is nothing that you cannot do. And Father, we thank you that through your plan of redemption, those things do not have to be terrifying to us. We thank you that because of Jesus and his work in our lives, those amazing aspects of your divine nature can be very comforting and encouraging to us. We are in awe of the fact that you have had a plan from all eternity. And we thank you for your patience with us that we might come into harmony with that amazing plan. We pray that you would be with us as we do our best to understand what you're telling us about that plan this morning. Be with us as we open our Bibles to this incredible letter. Thank you for preserving it for us and for this opportunity that we have to study and be encouraged and refreshed by this great section of Scripture. We pray that our hearts would be open and moldable and receptive. We pray that you'd be with all who are studying and teaching throughout this building this morning. The only reason we're able to offer this prayer to you is because of Jesus. We rejoice in His triumphant resurrection from the dead. And we offer this prayer to you in His mighty name. Amen. Romans chapter 8 is where we are this morning. One more time, if you did not get a copy of the material, please be sure to get a copy of that just outside of the doors. You see we're at the top of page 51, it reminds us that we left off last Sunday morning in Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. We obviously don't have time to go back and, and look at all 17 verses. If you weren't able to be here, I'd encourage you to access the video that's already available of that. We left off in verses 16 and 17. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. There is going to be a, a strong tenor here over the course of the next few verses of suffering. Suffering is a reality in this present life. We asked there in the, the right sidebar, how would you describe, in your own words, the sufferings of this present time? When you think of suffering, what comes to mind? Alan? Physical pain, emotional pain, psychological pain undoubtedly is a part of this present time. Nancy, you had your hand raised. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it is very easy for us to feel very insulated, but we understand through the marvel of modern communication that there are terrible things going on in the world even this very morning, all over the place. That is a marker of the sufferings of this present time. Other things that you think of, Ruby? I know I suffer with unbelief. Okay. We struggle with unbelief and with doubt because of many of the terrible things that characterize our world. 
Even disciples of Christ struggle with how to reconcile these dark, terrible things that we see with what we're being told in the Bible. I appreciate you being open about that this morning. Anything else that you think of, Dwayne? One of the things I think about is just when the Bible paints a picture of us of uh, heaven. Okay. There's no tears, there's no sadness, there's no anything. It's just you know, glorification of God, His happiness is drawing close to God. You know, I know while we're down here, we don't have that. Right. You know, and, and we have that physical removal of Christ, that we have that daily disappointment that I know that I continue to sin and that I, yeah. I'm, I'm putting myself in a barrier between them. So when, when you look at that, you know, that every day is that reminder. Absolutely. This is not heaven. More about that here in just a moment. Go ahead. Not that any of this isn't all relevant, mm -hmm. very important, very true. But in order to truly understand what Paul's talking about, you need to bring it down to the personal reality. Sure. So I can't find the most controversial subject in the world today in America homosexuality. Okay. If you stand up for homosexuality, you will be uh, against it, I have to say. Mm -hmm. As God has instructed, you will become a social pariah. Mm -hmm. No one will talk to you, you will be rejected, it will cause problems at work, in the family, with your friends. So that is one issue. Now, if you stand up for right. God has said, you will suffer. We will hear from Paul here in just a moment about uh, the, the stand that he and others were, were taking and, and the, the, the backwash effect of that, right? As uh, there was pushback from society. That continues to be the case, undoubtedly. Persecution from other people. Paul, go ahead. Yeah, you know, each of us can probably make a list of different sufferings. Mm -hmm. We all have our... Uh, and we kind of look back and look at Satan right at the beginning in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. That's where it all began with the fall of man. Right. And right. and we are... The sufferings have just dealt through the last 6,500 years or however. And it's going to continue to happen until the end of the earth until we all return sure. to Jesus if we have that ability. Sure, absolutely. You, you see with me up there at the top of page 51, as Christians, we are being called to walk a difficult walk. It is a walk that is Father-defined and Christ-centered and Spirit-led, Gospel-empowered, faith-fueled, glory-focused. It will, at times, lead us down pathways of suffering. The question is, is it going to be worth it? Right, And that is much of what Paul is encouraging us to think about, beginning in verse 18. Will this be worth it? And the Spirit's answer throughout the rest of Romans 8 represents great encouraging news. First of all, in verse 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. To Dwayne's point earlier, what is the value? Whether we're talking from a spiritual point of view or a physical point of view, what is the value of trying to compare what we presently have with what we will have or what we are now versus what we can be. What's the value of making those sorts of comparisons? Why do we do that? Donna? Okay, it strengthens our hope, has the unique power to put things into perspective for us, especially when we're grappling with questions of is it going to be worth it? Is the hard work going to be worth where I am now versus where I want to be? Whether we're talking about our physical health or our emotional well-being or our spiritual focus, this is where I am now, but this is where I'm going. And where I'm going is Better, this is where I am right now, but this is who I could be, and this is greatly to be preferred. It, it gets hope focused in our minds. Casey, you had your hand raised. Go ahead. Any goal you set is growth. Okay? It's going to push me to growth. That's a good way of putting it. Is that still my hand, sir? There we go. <laughs> Got to grow to put up your hand faster. <laughs> Similarly, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16, same writer 
writing to saints in another location. This is the way that he puts it. Verse 16 of 2 Corinthians 4. We do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Let's put things into perspective. And make some comparisons and contrasts. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. And we understand in the larger scope of God's revelation, the inner self is what matters most of all, right? Why is that? Because eventually our bodies are going to return to the dust as they were, but it is our spirits that are going to return to the God who gave them. And so with that perspective or that hope in mind, let's talk about what's going on right now. This light, momentary affliction is preparing it's helping us to grow it's preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen for the things that are seen are transient which means what they're very temporary right they're not going to last forever Notice that he does not say the things that are seen are pleasant. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say the things that are seen are easy. He doesn't say that, right? We're going to see that nowhere has God promised that as long as we put our faith in him, this is all going to be just enormously easy on the earth. Far from it, as we will see. But in order to help us establish perspective, these things are temporary. But the things that are unseen, those are the things that are eternal. Let's go to the top of page 52 in our material. This present, very transient time is a time characterized by groaning. I want you to notice three different times Paul uses that figure over the course of the next few verses. First of all, creation itself is groaning. Verse 19, the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. It's already come up, right, that we do not live in paradise here on the earth this is not heaven ever since genesis chapter 3 we have lived in a different world god creates in genesis 1 and genesis 2 and he looks at it all and he says what it is very good right he looks at mankind and describes male and female as very good the reality is you and i live in a Post Genesis 3 world. And ever since then, the creation has been groaning. We don't have any reason to believe that earthquakes existed in Genesis 1 and 2. Don't have any reason to believe that hurricanes and tornadoes and typhoons and tsunamis existed in Genesis 1 and 2. We obviously don't have any reason to to, to believe that there was strife between those created in God's image between Genesis 1 and 2. However, we choose to go against what God has clearly said and ever since then... One word that could characterize everything is groaning, right? Ever since then, God has said, you shall surely die. To the point that now in the New Testament, it is just assured. It is appointed for man to die once. Sometimes we die at the hands of each other. As human beings. Sometimes we die as a result of creation groaning. Sometimes we die as our physical bodies are turning in on themselves. Or just naturally aging and giving out. 
Clearly, though, one word that encapsulates all of this is we live in a world that is groaning, a world that was subjected to futility by the Creator. Okay, but creation isn't the only thing that is groaning. In verse 23, not only the creation, but we ourselves. Who's the we? Specifically within the context, it's Christians, right? Not all of humanity is concerned with this. Not all of humanity falls within the scope of the wonderful promises of Romans 8. Because a whole lot of humanity is leaving God out of its thinking. We ourselves, Paul says, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Why do Christians groan? Creation groans. Why do we also groan? Sandy? Because we don't know where we want to go to heaven. We don't know where we're going to go to heaven. Okay. We basically can't wait for it. Okay. We want it. We want it now. Like, we need to do this. We want to go to heaven. We want to go to heaven. We have hope that has been shown to us by God, but we're not there yet right and so we groan because we eagerly want to go there alan why do we groan yeah the foolishness of god is wiser than the the wisdom of men right Okay, not everybody's willing to listen to this. To many people, this is foolishness. Paul is communicating to us these are words from God himself. But we live in a world that is very skeptical about that, and that might lead us to groan. Why else do we groan, even as Christians? Phil? Yeah. We are surrounded by ungodliness. Vanessa? Absolutely. Yeah. We groan as Christians because we experience brokenness right along with the rest of the world. Okay? The difference is the Christian has God-defined hope. Right, And that becomes clear even more as we get into verse 26. The creation itself is groaning. We ourselves are groaning. But this is something that we can take great hope in. Verse 26, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what to pray for as we are. We have hope. And so we know that there's someone there we can pray to. But we don't always even know what to pray or how to pray. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And He who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Appreciate this threefold groaning point here. The creation is groaning, number one. We ourselves are groaning. What difference does this third point of groaning make in all of this? Why does this matter? Why is this point number three that makes points one and two, puts them into their proper perspective? Okay. Yeah. All right. Sometimes the weight of what we're enduring is heavy beyond words but we're not alone right isn't that the point of point number three 
Creation itself is groaning under the weight of sins. And Christians groan right along with those around us who are subject to all sorts of brokenness. We have hope. We're eagerly looking forward to something. Point number three makes all the difference because it establishes God sees. And God knows. And God hears. He has not, in His divine wisdom, said, you won't have to go through the groaning. You won't have to go through the suffering. Remember that? That's our anchor point in verse 18. This world is characterized by brokenness. Period. For Christian and for non-Christian. But here's the hope. We can't see it with our physical eyes. If we could, then it wouldn't be hope. Right? Who hopes for what he sees? It's not a, a present thing that we can hold in our hands, but we believe. This entire first seven and a half chapters of Romans has been all about the obedience of faith. I'm going to submit to God because I believe he has a purpose. I'm going to submit to God because I believe he is in control. Which leads Paul to say in verse 28, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. It's an incredible verse that is very frequently taken out of context. Let's think about what he's not saying. He does not say all things are good, right? This world is full of things that are not good. Sandy? I, I think when you have my mind to say, earthly pleasures are not good. Okay. okay. There, there are plenty of things that would lead us. Right. Plenty of things here on the earth that would lead us away from God. All things are, are not good. He, he doesn't tell us all things are good. Neither does he tell us love God and all things will be good. Right? I, I'm afraid a, a lot of times that's what we hear or, or see when we've got a, you know, coffee mug with Romans chapter 8 28 printed on it or something nothing wrong with with having that on a coffee mug let's just make sure that we appreciate what it's actually saying and what it's not saying he is not telling us that if you love God life on this earth is going to be great no that's what this entire chapter is all about neither does he say all things will work together for my immediate good if I begin reading in Genesis and I read to this point, surely that comes through loud and clear. Joseph would have something to say about that, right? Joseph spends a really long time in prison and God knows exactly where he is and Joseph gets to the point where he's able to look back and say what you, my own brothers, meant for evil, God meant for good. And That's an incredibly mature perspective that Joseph manifests there at the end of Genesis. But it sure didn't feel like it in the moment as he was sitting in prison, right? Just because I love God doesn't mean everything's going to go my way. Not at all. And so if he's not saying those things, what is he saying? Go ahead. One of the key underlying things that's not stated that is implied in this verse is that you must trust God. Yeah, absolutely. This this hinges on faith, no if doubt. If you don't have a trust in God, you won't see the over overlying scheme. Okay. As, and but now people will make these last two or three things like saying it's not. What he's saying is if you trust in God, mm -hmm. if you place that hope and faith in him. They know that what comes, you'll say, that is for the best. Okay. Ruby? Um, <clears throat> this, this, this may apply to that. Uh, I had, when I was praying this morning, me and you, 
all the woes that I'll have, I'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, telling him all of this, and then I think, you know, it's, uh, you know, you're in pain, I'll say. In pain, your heart is heavy, and you're praying that you know there's better, something better coming. Okay. And that you want him to take care of it. Okay. You know, take care of it now. Yeah. But in his time, it's really hard for me to get come quickly because when you, you think if it comes quickly and this is all over, mm -hmm. the people who are thinking about being Christians never have the opportunity to do it. And right. I'm totally like this. Right. Sure. Sure. You, you desperately want him to come so that the groaning will stop, but you desperately want people to have time. You want him to be patient. That, that leads to groaning that, that we have a hard time even putting into words. You know, to, to put a, a statement of Paul on some of the first things you said, that, that's what he means by casting our burdens before his throne, right? Not being anxious, but taking these enormous burdens and laying them before his throne because we trust him. Dwayne, what's he saying here? So I think about this, and this is the same Paul that had the thorn in the flesh. Mm -hmm. And he prayed to God, remove this thorn, and, and God said, no. Okay. And, you know, I think about the fact that, to me, I think Paul's trying to say that even our suffering, even those things, that there's a purpose for it. Yeah. When we see that, you know, we, we just read about the groaning. We mm -hmm. just read about the fact that there, there are things going on in this world and there's a reason for groaning. There, there's a purpose and there's a reason for them. And right. I think it's in preparation, again, for us to so much more appreciate what's coming. If this, was, if this life was easy for us, what appreciation would we have? Okay. It's the same Paul who is able to say from prison to Christians in uh, Philippi, yes, I'm in prison, but my chains have actually led to the spread of the gospel even here in prison. Not a whole lot of good being chained up, you know, in, in the immediate, tangible, uh, right here, personal sense, right? But good can come from that. We could spend the rest of the quarter uh, plumbing the depths of some of the things that are talked about here. It's ultimately pointing us to the fact, again, God knows. Okay, If I buy into one of these things that he is not saying, what might that lead me down as far as my conception of God? You know, if I buy into the idea, Romans 8.28 is telling me all things are good, but then I experience things that really aren't good, might I then be led to have a very false conception of God, whether he's even there or whether he is good or whether or not he's really in control. If I buy into the idea that Romans 8, 28 is saying, well, love God and all things will be good and then bad things happen, that, that leads me perhaps to, to doubt God. You get the idea. That's not what he's saying. All things happen to Christians just like they happen to non-Christians. However, Christians have a hope that is defined by God himself. Four, verse 29, anytime we run across significant statement and significant statement with a word like four in the middle, serves as like a little link, right? For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. I encouraged you in the material to go back and to read Ephesians chapter 1 is a helpful parallel passage. We obviously don't have time to do that now. But just appreciate what is being said here very quickly. We're about out of time. What connects these together? Why the hope of verse 28 has a foundation. Why is verse 28 true? For it is the connecting word. And let's just break it down more visually. God foreknew. God, nothing has snuck up on him. 
Nothing has surprised him. It's not that his people now are in a horrible predicament and now God's got to come up with some divine ingenuity to figure all of this out. No, we're dealing with a being who is outside of the scope of all of our limitations. Time, knowledge, presence, power. He's not confined by any of those things. Why is verse 28 true? Well, here's the undergirding. God foreknew. God predestined those whom He foreknew to be conformed to the image of His Son. The aim of God is that human beings would choose to be conformed to look like His Son. Well, how is God, who knows all things, going to get people from point A to point B when we are very unholy? How is He going to show us the means whereby we can be holy as He is holy? The aim of the Father's plan is that His Son might be the firstborn among many brothers. God is going to build a family around His Son who gave His life for everyone. How is He going to do that? We obviously know what His Son does as He comes here. Those whom the Father predestined, He also called. This is especially where Ephesians 1 comes to be helpful. If you haven't taken the time to read that. How does God do the calling? Through the gospel, right? God is calling through the gospel. God is willing to build a family around His Son. Those whom the Father called, He also justified. People, Jew or Gentile, male or female, slave or free, who answer that call are justified. They are realigned with their heavenly creator. Those whom the Father justified, He also glorified. And that's what points us forward, right? God not only forgives us of our sins and then turns us loose in this terrible dark jungle, God knows exactly what He's doing. And the end of it all is glory. Which leads Paul to say in verse 31, What then shall we say to these things? If we serve this kind of God, and He is for us, whoever it is that lines up against us doesn't stand a chance before Him. Read that particularly remembering who it is that's receiving this letter. The people who live in the city of Caesar himself. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him, the centerpiece of this family, graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding in a present, ongoing tense for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Paul is able to quote from the Old Testament. For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. It was hundreds of years old in Paul's day. Paul is able to say this is true now and in very real parts of the world today. It continues to be true. What is the answer to that? No. In all these things we are more than conquerors. But that's not where the statement ends. Because the strength and the ingenuity and the wit and all of that, it doesn't depend on us, right? There is deliverance available in and through the one who loved us. And so... Paul says, if you didn't have the time, I'd encourage you to go back and and read in verse 54. Remember how he introduced himself in Romans 1 and verse 1. He is speaking as an apostle. He is speaking as one who, who has been shown incredible revelations and now is sharing these things with ordinary human beings. And as an apostle, as someone who has been shown things he's not even allowed by God to talk about, he says... This is what I can tell you. I am sure. 
It's a question of whether or not we trust him, right? This man who saw Jesus, who who now his entire life has been reoriented around Jesus and is being carried along by the Holy Spirit of God, is saying, I am sure. Neither death nor life, angels, rulers, things present, things to come, powers, height, depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The key is, of course, especially when we remember the larger context, do I accept Christ, right? As a Jew, We'll notice as we get into Romans chapter 9 next week, Jews are still very, very much at the the forefront of Paul's audience in this letter. This is what God is able to do. This is what God will do in this new family. Do you trust His means of getting you there? Because if you do not trust and you do not submit to Him, this cannot apply you. I really appreciate you being here this morning. We've covered a massive section of Scripture. If you'd like to talk more about that, I would love to do that with you. 